Welcome everyone to the Engage Millennial Donors with Captivating Mobile Communications webinar presented by MobileCause. I'm your host, Chris Bechtel, and today we're going to show you how to turn today's tech-centric millennial generation into lifelong supporters of your cause. To get today's presentation delivered to your mobile phone right now, you can text millennial to, actually it's millennials, to 51555. That's M I L L E N N I A L S. So that's with a double L and double N. So that's text millennials to 51555, and we'll send you a link to the presentation. We have a great panel of experts here with us today. Um, we're, we're thrilled to have everyone. We have Adam Sadiq, peak performance coach for the millennial generation. Kristen Peruginog, Executive Director and found, Founder of her organization, which is founder of the Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence. We have Crudy Kanogia, Director of Client Services at Media Cause, and our very own Jeremy Koenig, the Creative Director and Product Designer of Mobile Cause. We're grateful to have all of you with us, and we have a jam-packed session for all of you. Um, everyone who is joining us today, feel free to type any questions that you do have into the chat. We're going to have a 10-minute uh, at least Q&A session at the end of today's webinar. Um, and before we dive into everything, I wanted to send all of you um, a poll so we can get a sense for you know where you are um, in sort of your relationship to um, promoting your cause to millennials. Um, so. I'm going to show this, go ahead and show this poll on screen. So if you all wouldn't mind, you know, taking a few moments, uh, filling out the poll, tell us what you think, um, where you are with um, your results um, in, in terms of engaging with millennials. Um, and again, if you need the reminder to get the presentation, you can text millennials to 51555. You'll see that in the chat on your left. That's millennials with an S. Um, and again, we're, we're super excited to have a great presentation here. So thank you all for filling out our poll here. This will give us some great insights. We can, uh, our speakers can kind of direct um, their insight towards some of the specific issues or challenges and goals that you may have with respect to communicating with millennials. We'll give it just another moment here. I'll show this on the screen, just another couple moments and then we'll dive right in. So it looks like uh, how to get people involved in donating is really the, the, the leader or all of followed by all of the above. So uh, fascinating. Thank you all for taking a moment here. I'll give it just another few seconds. So thanks all of you for, for contributing your votes. Excellent. I'm going to close the polling and move quickly into introducing Jeremy Koenig, my colleague, who's going to talk to us a little bit about what the definition of millennial is. Jeremy, welcome. Thanks, Chris, and welcome everyone on the call. We are so excited for all of you to um, learn from the inside of, of uh, not only Mobile Cause um, and what we've learned from uh, w watching thousands of fundraising campaigns, but also from our expert panel. Um, let me jump right in and get started with just defining millennial for the sake of this uh, presentation. Um, this is what, what, what I'm calling the fundraising definition of millennial. Uh, a millennial is a donor between the age of 18 and 34 that actually now makes up more than 50% of the workforce in the United States. This is incredible. Um, another way to think about this is if you are actually ignoring this demographic, you are ignoring half of the potential people that can donate to your cause. Pretty incredible when you think of it in that terms. Uh, millennials don't tend to carry cash or checks, and they prefer text, social media, and email communication. Uh, this generation refers for everything to be mobile and is largely resistant to traditional forms of fundraising, including direct mail, telemarketing, and formal events. Um, believe it or not, crowdfunding is actually their preferred method of giving. Uh, with all that being said, uh, millennials are consistently in our culture referred to as being misunderstood, but in reality, there's actually more data and information about them than any other generation. Um, we see here at Mobile Cause that the, the real challenge facing nonprofits is how do you collect 
uh, connect millennials to your mission in a way um, that shows them how by by working with you, they're going to change the world. That's ultimately what they care about. Um, to do that, our recommendation, um, as you'll see throughout the whole course of this presentation, is that you truly have to think differently and focus on different, th think differently about the way that you communicate and focus on the channels that millennials prefer. Um, so with that as our context for this presentation, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris to introduce our next speaker. Terrific, Jeremy. And uh, just a quick reminder again to everyone, we are recording this webinar. Um, so you will, if you registered by email, you will get a link to view the recording as well as a PDF of the presentation. Um, so there'll be, we'll, as well as we can send it to you by text link to your phone. So we're going to get it to you in all the channels that you might want to get it. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce Adam Sadiq, who is a millennial coach and leader of Peak Performance with Soul. Adam has worked with millennial CEOs, entrepreneurs, and change makers as a coach, mentor, and trusted advisor from and for the millennial generation. Welcome, Adam. Thank you, Chris, and thank you, everybody with Mobile Cost, for uh, giving me the opportunity to come here and share some awesome strategies and insights for all the amazing nonprofit leaders on board here. Um, you're all doing a very beautiful thing, and I highly encourage you right now just take a second and give yourselves a pat on the back for living a life based on a mission and service. And I wanna do whatever I can in the short time I have here to support you with the best strategies to be able to engage millennial donors. So yeah, so, so tell us, uh, what's your take on millennials? What's the, what should we all know? Yeah, great thing. Um, there's a couple things actually. And before I go right into that, I actually highly encourage everybody screenshots these this information here because i'm not going to reread it i want to just focus on giving you pure stats and pure pure insights millennials are honestly a generous bunch of people and if the stats have not shown it yet i didn't personally look this up but you can quote me on this millennials will be the most generous generation than all the other generations combined and that's a really bold thing to say but millennials is a core value they highly 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 value caring they highly value philanthropy they highly value giving they highly they're like if you ask any millennial what their biggest goal is in life they're going to say something along the lines of like changing the world but here's the thing is not everybody has the a constructive path to being able to make the change they want they sometimes they see it as an abstract thing you as a nonprofit leader have a mission have a cause that will change the world and has changed the world of other people's so you've changed people's worlds and you can be the bridge that helps millennials fulfill their highest destiny, which is they want to be the change in the world. I mean, there's a reason why we are different, you know, people, other generations, uh, not to <laughs> talk down about them or anything, but we've had some, um, we've definitely had some stereotypes about us. You know, people have definitely thought that we are entitled or, you know, that we're lazy or, you know, we're just, you know, we just don't get it uh, or we're not productive. Um, you know, we're just productive differently. Uh, it's not necessarily that we're lazy. It's just the old systems don't work for us. We have grown up in a time and a place in the world where technology has experienced its most rapid changes. And that has influenced us as a generation. That's influenced our psychology and that's influenced the way we communicate and connect. We are the most connected generation because social media gives us access and gives us the ability to connect with basically anybody anywhere in the world at any time. I mean, and with live streaming softwares now, which I'm going to actually go into a little bit later, it's, it's pretty phenomenal what you can, um, what you can do to connect with people. And um, just, just a couple things that I want you to, to take in consideration. So when it comes to millennials as a, as a whole, here's a pretty important statistic if you don't know it yet, All right, pretty important fact, but in about a year and a half, millennials are about to dominate the entire spending market. They're about to literally eclipse baby boomers, which has been the dominant generation in the spending market. And this is, it's only going to get bigger. Um, like I do have there in the slide, millennials do care about community. It's one of the biggest values, community diversity. Um, okay, I see a question. How is their care different from boomers? I want to just address that for a second. I'm not saying that uh, necessarily they care differently or anything, but millennials don't see 
differences so much as others do. And I'll give myself as an example right here, um, here in the States. So I'm a first generation American citizen. Uh, my parents came from Afghanistan. It, their parents did and their parents did and their parents did. Everybody in their classroom was Afghan, always. I grew up in a school district where I was the only person from that heritage. This really shook up things for me and it's caused me not to see things in boxes in the sense of, oh, this person's from here, this person's from there. I see more people as as people. I mean, today it's like, you know, you, you go to school district, you got a whole cultural mix here in, in the US, which is a really beautiful thing. And that does influence how people care more about others now because they're more exposed to other cultures, other perspectives, other philosophies, X, Y, Z. So this is just one of the things I want to talk about millennials. Um, make sure you screenshot this. Hey, Adam. Right yeah. So, so talk to us a little bit about, and one thing, everyone, in terms of screenshots, we'll send a PDF. So okay, perfect. Great. Yeah, so, this, so everyone will get all these statistics. I think one thing would be interesting for everyone to understand is, you know, first of all, maybe you can tell us a little bit about, you know, what is, you know, effective altruism? You know, what does that mean Absolutely. to you? Absolutely. What should people yeah. take away from that? So here is one thing that I've personally noticed has been different about millennial philanthropists base i mean just like when it comes to the charities that they want to support I'm not saying all of them but most of them and i'm talking about these are the people that i've worked with advise these are the leaders of our generation effective altruism is really i mean it's right there's underlined the word effective they want to create change they want to benefit the world in the most effective ways and if they don't know, if they don't have transparency, knowing exactly how their dollars are going to be used to make a world a better place, that's already causing some hesitancy from them donating with you. On top of that, also, I wouldn't even just look at it as a dollar perspective. Millennials have so many more resources available to them in, in the term of skills, in the term of how they can get um, awareness out there through social media that I wouldn't actually look at dollars as the only end goal when it comes from a donor perspective. In fact, I think you'd be very surprised how many more millennials are willing to donate their time, their services, their audiences, their connections, and other sorts of resources that you probably wouldn't have even been aware that would be beneficial for you, but might even create a multiple fold impact than if they were just to donate some dollars to you for the overall mission of your brand. And so effective altruism, it's, um, yeah, like I said, it's, it's really, you really want to focus on creating that transparency and showing how everything chunks down to little things works out. So for example, I think Charity Water does this. I'm, I'm just making up this stat if I'm remembering it properly, but I think it was something along the lines of like, um, for $20, you can provide uh, you know, one person in Ethiopia uh, with pure water for five years. So that, that knowing that it's like, whoa, to us, like, it just shows exactly how these dollars are being spent to create the change in the world, underline change the world, big, huge value that comes with the millennial generation. It's like the biggest desire at the heart of this generation. Um, seeing that we grew up with so much change. So, no, Adam, you know, one yeah. of the points that I think maybe I, I wanted to make sure everybody hears that you had made, I think, previously when we spoke to you about, you know, generic statements sort yeah. of, you know, don't really work, right? Like yeah. maybe in an older generation, I think. Could you just make, you know, sort of make that clear to everyone what you mean by that? Yes. All right. So, I mean, just for one, um, Please don't call millennials millennials. <laughs> don't call us millennials. See us as humans. Um, there's, I mean, these, it's just generalized statements and stuff. It's like, it starts to make the whole experience of connecting with us more robotic. Uh, we want, you want to focus on what we can do, how we can support, why we should care. Um, truth is we care, you know, and you want to show us, you know, how we can care and also give us flexibility to have other options to be able to support because it's in that flexibility that you can see the greatest freedom. Um, I know I just kind of 
took your question and took it a different angle. But um, if that doesn't answer it, I could go back and address it. Well, and it sounds like in order to, to get people really, truly involved, right, which is sort of the yeah. question everyone, you know, on the, uh, you know, on this webinar really needs to know. It, it yeah. sounds, uh, you know, is, is, would you suggest it's really details, right? It's like giving people a clear picture of how they can yeah. get involved, and what the impact of their involvement will, will really be. Is that yes. correct? Yeah. And storytelling is going to be your most powerful asset when it comes to that. I mean, if we really want to look at it since the dawn of humanity, when cavemen were drawing things on the cave walls, stories have been part of us, part of our species for such a long time. And the it's just uh, storytelling invoked with emotion is what's really going to capture capture us. I, again, I'm going to use Charity Water again. They're they're one of my favorite uh, organizations because I, everything I'm I'm highlighting in this the slide highlights they they do really well. And um, if you don't know about them, make sure to look them up because you'll get a really good example and reference point to it. Um, and it's like they had they released a story and they do this regularly. And I just remember this one that it it captivated me intensely. It was like. Um, the let's say it was like raya was a 13 year old girl and she she makes a trip every day to the watering hole where she collects water uh the water is really filthy but it's the only thing they can do and it's a four hour round trip walk for them um the this one day she was walking there uh with her friend and they got lost on the way back she saw her friend's dead body on the floor the water spilled um she realized what had happened and this had not been just the first time that this happened in their town or, or on this walk this happened many times uh there had been pirates that had been hiding there raping and murdering these young girls as they went to go get the water um this really called our attention as an organization so we came to build a pure water wall for the village. Now Raya doesn't have to take the risk of doing this anymore. People don't have to lose their daughters or their siblings because of this. And um, and your donation has been possible for this. Now that is like a really raw, intense story that you know shakes shakes people up. You don't necessarily have some have to have something like that intense if if your organization isn't isn't um, if that your organization hasn't been exposed to stories like that. But it just has to be emotional and it has to be real and it has to be transparent. The more you can explain what's going on and really just show them as a human, as a character, the more the people will connect with you. I mean, you want to even just look at something else. Tell me what so, generation. Oh, I'm just going to. Yeah, so sorry. So, so uh, this is great stuff, Adam. And obviously, I want to keep us moving along because we have so much content. Oh, yeah. I think you have some great insight. You know, so in addition to storytelling that is impactful and and, and really connects uh, on an emotional level with the yes. viewer, what other recommendations do you have? What uh, what else should nonprofits today be doing differently to better engage with millennials? Yeah, so the great question. And uh, they're actually uh, on the next slide. I'd like to talk about one of the best tools and a couple other tools. Um, but one thing, just to hit that emotional thing. Tell me one generation that uses emojis more than the millennial generation. There is a there is a clear insight that millennials respond to emotions, and now it's all about feelings and emotions and all social platforms. So you can get that across your story. You're starting to speak their language, and and it's it's going to be powerful. But anyways, here's Snapchat. Um, everybody, uh, you should have been on Snapchat six months ago, but it's okay. You can still get on Snapchat now. Uh, and not just Snapchat, I actually want to highlight one more technology that is going to be super phenomenal for you, and it's called Facebook Live. And I'm gonna, I want to actually focus a little bit more on that because there's some really cool research that I came up across in the, in the past few weeks, um, actually in the past few days. But um, Facebook Live, first of all, Facebook has set up the algorithm for Facebook Live. So whenever you make Facebook Live posts, those posts are going to be more valued in people's news feeds than just any other kind of post. As far as it goes from a donor perspective, from Facebook Lives, uh, Facebook's advertising platform, you can actually see, you can actually target, you can create ads that don't have to be like a, first of all, I wouldn't recommend 
making advertisements that are only focused on on getting millennials to donate. You want to tell them stories. You want to get them get them juiced up with the purpose of why they're why they should care about this, why they should support, and then the donation just starts to happen naturally. But here's the thing. You can actually see who your most engaged viewers are from your Facebook page now through using Facebook Live's algorithms. And um, you can actually target just those people. So now you're advertising dollars when it comes to connecting with millennials who are on mobile, who are on Facebook, who are going to respond more to these social media campaigns than they are through direct mail or someone standing outside of Whole Foods. Um, you can use those dollars better create raving fans who believe in your mission and want to support you and want to go out of their way and tell other people about it and crowdfunding is again another really great tool but anyways so adam so yeah. sorry to interject and i want to get make sure we get all of this to everybody and also because this is mobile right i mean do you again see that most millennials are primarily um you know interacting with yep. nonprofits on their mobile device more than anything else mobile is going to be the best way and it's, it's just going to keep getting that way so you got to do it. But yeah, right. so. Uh, and now the other thing that's come out, and I'm sure you've, you know, again, people have commented a few times in here, but it's Instagram, right? Now, Instagram is actually trying to kill Snapchat. To yeah, them. they are. They got their stories going on now. It's a pretty new addition. But so regardless, I still recommend Snapchat and Instagram. And I, Snapchat, Instagram, Facebook, they are going to be powerful. Facebook Live just trump Periscope in a sense. Unless you have a pretty great Twitter following, you know, I'd still continue yes. to Periscope. Um, so I wouldn't say that's out of the question per se, but just to know that these tools are all available. The power is going to be in live streaming. Snapchat is not out of out of the history book. Snapchat is going to reiterate. Snapchat is going to get bigger. Snapchat is going to be the powerhouse. And in about 18 months, the whole quote unquote, the whole world is going to be on Snapchat. But right now you got the most engaged millennials in the world on Snapchat. And when you use Snapchat, first of all, Snapchat requires a commitment. Okay. You know, Facebook, you can get away with posting a few times a week, but Snapchat, you got to be using it every day and you got to use it strategically in a sense of really telling on what's going on. Snapchat's your, Snapchat is literally like your way of showing what's really going on inside or behind the scenes with your nonprofit. And, and this is going to build transparency. And Adam, you know, and I know probably for for a lot of those that are listening that are, you know, of a certain demographic, you know, Snapchat can be rather confusing. And yeah. so you say that the basically the main feature of Snapchat you're talking about is really stories. It's just correct? the stories. You don't have to do anything other than stories. And your stories can literally be the same thing that you put on Instagram stories or just slightly modified. But Facebook Live one facebook live is going to be relevant for every single person on this call and everybody who's going to listen to it that has to be non-negotiable i highly recommend jumping on snapchat now because regardless it's going to be relevant for you in some months and if you start now you can jump on the wave back before they do anything back this is it's like jumping on snapchat now is basically like getting back on facebook and using their advertising feature when it was free instead of having to pay for it now we have right. no idea what Snapchat's going to do. They're a massive, massive company. They're a multi-billion dollar company. They're just going to keep getting bigger. And um, you have no idea what's going to really... And it's if better you, to jump now, yeah. Right. And and I totally get... I, now, if you were to recommend to those listening, if they had to pick, because you kind of talked about three here, Facebook Live, yeah. Snapchat, Instagram Stories. If you had to pick one, Right. Um, for someone, because it can feel rather if you had to pick one to at least to 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 dive into today, which one would you recommend somebody start with? Before I had uh, created the slides, I would have said Snapchat. But even in just the past few weeks, a lot of things have changed. I would say get on Facebook Live immediately and do at least one Facebook Live a week. But I would also say get on Snapchat too. I wouldn't say just, I, I think Snapchat has to be integrated. You don't have to focus so much on the Instagram stories right now, but Snapchat is a very different platform than Facebook. It's very different in its nature and it can't be excluded or ignored. And then when you do it, when you're on Snapchat, you have to make sure that you're constantly promoting your Snapchat feed through Facebook and just showing people other ways of like, how they can get involved. So I'm just making this up. If you make a Facebook title, you know, the, the, 
the the header for your Facebook page, and you can include your Snapchat Snapchat uh, username there, and say something like uh, "Change the world with us." Uh, follow us on Snapchat to see how your how your donations are changing lives. You know, now it's like it creates transparency. You don't have to use those exact words, but something that's going to be catchy, something short, sweet, to the point, and that's really going to engage people to want to follow you. And when people follow you, they become fans, and you can direct their attention from Snapchat to other places. So. Get on Facebook Live immediately, at least once a week, and get on Snapchat every day. That's what my what I'd say. Thank you so much, Adam. And we have a lot of great questions, so everybody keep keep you know submitting your questions, and we'll do our best to get to as many of them as we can. Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Kristen Pruganog. Thank you for joining us. Hello. How are you today? Thank you I'm for doing being well. Thank you. So let me introduce Kristen officially. She is the executive director and founder of Break the Silence Against Domestic Violence, a nonprofit organization that educates communities on the dangers of domestic violence and connects and assists victims and survivors in the transformation of their lives. Extremely important work. So thank you for taking time out to join us and share some of your insights. Uh, around millennials with us. So my first question is, um, you know, maybe you could tell us a little bit about, A, you know, your work, and then, you know, what you see are the main differences between millennial donors and others. Sure. So our organization, in a nutshell, um, I like giving a little bit of a story, just like the previous speaker just mentioned. Um, Our organization title kind of encompasses what we do. We encourage people to break the silence against domestic violence and we do it by storytelling by engaging them to speak out to be a part of our culture and to ultimately create a movement of people um, of all ages to um, talk about domestic violence so our work um, encompasses a variety of different things from survivor retreats to empowerment groups to facebook live videos um, to um, a lot of different things that essentially help survivors uh, and victims of domestic violence get their life back. Um, And to answer your second question, how do we engage millennial donors? Well, I'm a millennial, and I started this organization when I was 22 years old after getting out of an abusive relationship. And I told myself that I, if I survive, or since I survived this relationship, that I wanted to do something. I wanted to do more than just sweep this under the rug and not ever talk about what happened to me. Um, So I use my story as a platform to encourage other people to break their silence. And almost five years later, our organization has beyond tripled, I don't know what's bigger than tripled, but it's tripled every single year of its existence. Um, Our donor base has significantly increased over the last five years, but more particularly in the last month, thanks to most cause. And, um, It's really exciting to be on the call. Um, The last webinar that I actually participated in, I was a guest, and because of the success of our angel run, which I will get into in a minute, um, I'm here as a presenter. So thank you very much. Um, So we use our mobile cause to um, encourage people to donate. And what we've used in the past was PayPal. And uh, what I have seen as a significant, significant, and I can't even emphasize even more, significant, increase in donations because of mobile cause. Um, I have really seen this to be a great way for us to, one, engage donors, two, to get more donors, three, allow people to sign up, make a donation literally in 90 seconds. I've timed it before. Um, And it's an easy way for people to be sitting at work or to be sitting at home or sitting at school or literally walking anywhere. Um, to just make a donation by texting. So for our angel run in particular, which I think might be the next slide, um, well, actually, it's the third, next slide after this, but we used um, texting and texting a text messaging during, yes, during our angel run to um, engage people to tell them what we were doing. So um, would you like me to jump into the angel run right now? or? Sure, yeah. I mean, and I think, it, you know, again, for everyone listening, you know, this is obviously this is how mobile cause works. And and I think what's important probably with respect to millennials, right, is sort of your point um, before we dive into the specific story here is that you, you were using sort of PayPal before, but because you switched to 
you know, means by which millennials prefer to engage mm -hmm. with you. Is that right? I mean, is that, that sort of why you've seen the difference is because now you're using multiple channels that make it super easy to give? What's your take? Um, sorry, can you repeat that question? Yeah, like I guess it goes back to like, you, you know, the fact that you've kind of made it easy for people to give by text to give. Yes. Right? Is that why, yes. is like, is that yes. why you've seen such a great success? Absolutely. So, so like I said, we had PayPal before, and we had a really difficult time trying to get people to donate and try to get them to understand how to donate, what, the do what they're donating for, and ultimately for them to want to give, the literal emotion of giving. Um, they couldn't figure out how to do it, and it was just too difficult. And I'm sure everyone here on the call can agree that if something was just a little too difficult for us to understand, we just kind of wipe our hands clean with it and just move on and hope that it doesn't have to come up again. So luckily, with the ease of mobile cause, we have been able to literally give people three letters, five numbers, and that's all they have to do um, to engage them to donate. And it, it was so simple, and keeping things simple for millennials is the way to do it, um, especially we're in this era where millennials, you know, I guess are coined or joke, people joke about millennials having like ADD because we want to look at something to now run to the next thing. So um, I feel like that's me sometimes that if I don't understand it right now, then I want to do something else. And if I'm doing something else, I still want to continue working on other things and pretty much multitasking. Um, so uh, that's kind of, our scope of how we engage our donors. And to also add on to that, um, one of the key things that I'd like to mention is that we had the opportunity to do a uh, electronic billboard on one of our freeways in San Diego. And my main goal was to get donors to see this billboard and to donate, but I could not figure out how to um, do that. I couldn't figure out how I would get donors to see the billboard and then give them an action item to okay see this now I'm going to donate because all we had was our website and if I'm driving down the freeway I'm not going to remember break the silence dv.org on a billboard or any other website whether it's charity water or something it it it, it was too difficult for someone to do so um, one of our board members and myself thought it would be a great idea to do text to donate because if I see something while I'm driving and it says text DTS to 71777, that's an easy way for people to remember because of the numbers and also the three uh, letters that people can just type in, hopefully not while they're driving, um, to donate, to learn more, and ultimately to engage. So that was our, um, that was our strategy, and it's working. Fantastic. And so, yeah, maybe you can take us through, you know, take us through, you know, some of the campaigns that you've done and how you thought about it. And, you know, I'm, I'm guessing, you know, that you also have beyond just millennial donors, you also have older donors. And so maybe one thing, even though we're talking about millennials today, is how do you both focus on millennials as well as not alienate your older generation? Were you thinking about that as you sort of architected your campaigns here? Um, so there, I guess I can answer that in two ways. So our organization um, started on Facebook, and it's, I guess, really cool because most organizations don't necessarily do that. Um, we, I started by sharing my restraining order on Facebook, so storytelling um, at its finest, I guess. Um, so I shared my restraining order on Facebook after I left my abusive relationship literally a month before. And um, that encouraged people around the world to start writing in, to ask me questions and things like that. And so what we've done for the last almost five years, it'll be five years this December, um, we've done different social media campaigns to really get the community talking about the issue. And we want men, women, young, old, black, white, it doesn't matter, to be a part of the conversation and what I like to say, make it cool to talk about domestic violence. We all know that domestic violence is a horrible issue that – we, we don't want to see in our world, but how are we going to address the issue in a different way? So what we do is different social media campaigns, and we actually have a very provocative one that I won't uh, share with you now, um, launching in October for Domestic Violence Awareness Month. So um, 
we are going to be gearing up for that and also using Mobile Cause to uh, encourage people to become members. So we're going to be doing a membership drive in October and um, using that as a um, platform for us to raise even more money. Um, so one of the campaigns that we've done in the past uh, during the time of the Janae Rice and Ray Rice situation um, was uh, 100 Reasons Why We Stayed. And so we were able to get uh, people involved by submitting their photos and posting them on Facebook, and we actually created a photo book that um, has basically over 100 reasons why survivors of domestic violence had stayed in abusive relationships. So we think of campaigns that we know people are going to want to participate in, number one. Um, Two, ones that are creative and uh, allow people to think about what we're doing. Um, We want ultimately people to share it on Facebook, share it on other social media platforms, But what we've noticed is that when people are able to participate themselves, they feel like they are a part of something. And one thing that our organization does very well is that beyond just um, saying thank you for supporting us, thank you, thank you, thank you, um, we make sure that our donors know that they are a part of our family. So BTS, Break the Sounds for short, um, we call it our BTS family. So when you invest into us, you are investing into our family. So when anyone donates to us, uh, they are a part of our family as well. Um, So I'll get into the Angel Run real quickly. So our Angel Run, in a nutshell, we, uh, as an organization, we shine a light on our angels, women who have been killed from domestic violence. And so this is uh, our way of, you know, showing people that, honoring um, our angels who have lost their lives to domestic violence. So this shows our donors, our supporters, our families that have lost their loved ones that we are honoring their angels. Um, So um, with that being said, our angel run was inspired by one of our volunteers who is an avid marathon runner. Um, She actually ran 13 miles for 13 days back in February, and she wanted to raise money for our organization. Um, so she raised $1,500 in 13 days by running every day. That was pretty amazing. Um, I am in no way a runner, <laughs> so um, I said, you know what, I want to take this idea, this an effort that she did, and grow it. So what my goal was was um, to create this thing called the Angel Run, where we would honor 22 angels um, for 22 days with 22 runners, and the significance of 22, just in a short little story, is the age that I left my abuser. Um, And um, so with that being said, I had no idea that the success of the Angel Run was going to be as big as it was. Um, We actually had over 400 Angel Runners. We had about 432, um, and we raised about $46,000 in 22 days. This is the most money we've ever raised in the history of any fundraiser with our organization since its inception. Um, so we were very surprised. We grew our number of angel, angel teams that we had to 24. So teams, by what I mean, is we honored 24 different women who have lost their lives to domestic violence. Um, if you, I believe, text the Run BTS to 51555, you will get to uh, learn more about what our platform looked like. We had uh, 24 different teams where if they were to click on a different team, they would get to learn more about that particular angel, their story, see photos of them. And so each team had a goal of raising $2,200. Um, some teams raised uh, more than $2,200. Team Megan raised over $8,000, which you'll see right here um, on the right-hand side. Um, And some teams didn't raise the $2,200. But, again, I believe that teamwork makes a dream work, so it's it's all in good fun that we raise the money. Um, It's not in good fun for raising the actual money because the money is going back to our programs, but it uh, it was a good fun competition amongst team members who are participating Um, A lot of my friends participated on various teams, and we had little competitions with one another um, about who could raise the most money, and uh, it was really a great success for us. Um, In turn, when we did the campaign, we made sure to let our donors know that our funding is going to go to particular programs. Um, During the time of our Angel Run, we were also spotlighted um, the different programs that are going to be supported through this effort, 
Um, one mainly was our Grants of Hope Financial Empowerment Program, where we shared testimonials, shared what exactly the program was, and ultimately let people know that, hey, this is where your dollars are going. Um, that's one thing that we're still working on as an organization. Um, because our organization is still so new, I'm still learning things. So um, definitely letting your donors know where exactly their dollars are going um, is a huge way to in encourage them to donate more. So through this campaign, we've raised the most money that we've ever raised, and uh, we're able to collect 800 new names, contact information, phone numbers, emails, for future campaigns um, in uh, this year and um, hopefully get some lifetime members with us. So that is our angel run in a nutshell. And this is great, that's Kristen. what I have. Yes, thank you so much. And everyone, we have some great questions. You know, we have so much content. We're going to get to um, more questions for Kristen. Um, I think the one point that I just wanted to make um, just to, before we move on to the next speaker is – is so we, this is an example of both text to give as well as crowdfunding, correct? So you both used text to give as well as the crowdfunding features of mobile cause. Is that right? Yes, yes, yes. So let me um, uh, elaborate on that. So we actually saw more donors participate through text to donate than our actual crowdfunding thing. Um, I, I think that makes sense. So more people actually did. My text donate code was run BTS seven to seven one seven seven seven. So people were able to donate to my particular fundraising effort, um, as opposed to my teams, as opposed to the whole campaign, which was just run BTS. So if someone wanted to donate to my particular effort, they were able to do that. Or if they just wanted to donate to the effort as a whole, they could have did the the um, the main one. But we had four hundred and thirty two runners, registered runners. So they had 432 different options and where they could support um, their donation. But ultimately, all donations went back to the run BTS. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And everyone, I know we have a lot of great questions. So we will um, capture as many of them as we can. And, you know, as we as I mentioned before, we're recording this webinar. So you'll be able to watch, listen, share with colleagues, rewind. Um, so you can go back and get anything you missed and all of these answers to your questions will be recorded so you can, you know, um, ultimately get all of this content. And of course, um, you know, Mobile Cause has a fantastic team of customer success managers um, that, you know, have worked with Kristen and others so that, you know, after the webinar, you're, you're absolutely um, recommended that you speak to all of us about some specific situations and use cases that you might have. Um, so I would encourage everyone to do that. So now I'd like to move on to our next speaker, Crudy Kanogia. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to uh, make a proper introduction um, momentarily. So Crudy is the Director of Client yeah. Services at Media Cause, an agency helping nonprofits and social enterprises leverage the power of digital to accelerate the impact of organizations and individuals doing good around the world. Welcome, Crudy. Thanks for joining. Thanks so much. Um, it's great to be here. I am really excited to kind of talk about how to make this real because I'm seeing a lot of questions coming in just on, okay, sounds great. How do we do this? And um, at Media Cause, we work with so many different nonprofits, um, from small organizations to big international nonprofits, and it's surprising how similar the challenges are, kind of no matter who you are. Um, the main thing that we do is we do communications and user experience modeling. So the communication strategies I'll talk to you about in a little bit, but the User experience, um, which is you know just a fancy word for how does it work, is so important because one of the biggest mistakes you can make is spending a ton of money on a campaign and then all of a sudden it's hard for somebody to kind of complete the transaction. So making it super easy for somebody to donate, text to donate is a great example for um, making sure that your donation page is optimized, making sure that 
it's easy to share once you've made a donation. All of that is super, super important. So the way we like to do it is to start backwards. Start with what that transaction page is and then build back from there. Um, so pick the easiest way to actually make that donation and then promote that. Make it easy to give. So a lot of times it helps to give context where it's, um, you know, $10 buys a life jacket, $15 um, buys this much water, $20 is going to buy three sweaters for this family. However you can make it con contextually simple for somebody to understand what it is that they're giving to is going to go so much further than leaving it open-ended. Um, the other thing that I really wanted to point out is we've been talking about millennials like it's one lump of people. It's not. The people that voted for Bernie Sanders and made a ton of noise are not the same people that are playing Kim Kardashian's game. So it's a mistake to assume that talking to one millennial is talking to all of them. To Adam's point, please don't call us millennials. We're people too. Uh, we, we have different interests and different passions, and that's what I want to kind of show you is if you analyze the way people are coming into you and the messages, the exact messages they're responding to, you're going to find what we call personas within your audience. Um, so going into the next slide here, one of our clients is called MOAS. They're the Migrant Offshore Aid Station. They were doing some great work um, in the Mediterranean and Aegean seas where they um, for, they were the people that were rescuing refugees. They were saving them from drowning. It's a very crowded space. So for those of you that are coming from nonprofits where you might think, well, I'm competing against the YMCA, or I'm competing against the Boys and Girls Club, or I'm competing against these huge organizations, you can absolutely stand out. You can absolutely find your value proposition. MOAS was in the same space as the United Nations Human Rights Commission, the same people, um, the Save the Children was there, International Rescue Committee was there, but what we found was that the people that supported MOAS had very distinct reasons for doing so. One reason were the humanists. They, to them, there's a right and there's a wrong. It's wrong to let people drown. And so that's why when MOAS reached out to these people, their message was very simple. We saved 11,000 people because it was the right thing to do. Um, and that message really resonated with this, this ethos. Again, not, not everyone kind of feels the same way. So if I look at the next persona, an impact speaker, these people are, well, what are you doing? All of, there's so much talk about this space, and there's so many organizations there. What more can we do? So these people really connect with some with operational updates. We're setting sail now. We've got this many miles to cover. We've got this many people on board. We've got this many um, medical staff. We have this many life jackets. If you give us $12 more, we'll have another life jacket. Things like that, the real impact was what resonated the most there. So this newsletter, um, when we started understanding these messaging tactics and using this um, messaging, we saw email open rates increased by between 30 and 50 percent. We saw click-throughs on emails skyrocket to 27 to 32 percent. The, the most important thing that we did with this was re-engage donors. So somebody that's given to you once, you don't want to go back to the drawing board and have to find all new people. But if you continue to show impact with this impact speaker persona, they will donate to you again. And if you think about it, you're using, you're using the same amount of resources to re-engage a much more likely to donate set of people. So it's a better investment um, as far as just kind of a donation or fundraising campaign goes. So one of the best ways to do this methodology-wise is to send out a survey. Um, we really like open response surveys. 
to kind of get direct um, quotes from people. So if you look here, this is these are people saying, you're the only person, people saving lives at sea, NATO sending them back. Okay, great. So this helps us understand that inaction with politics is a frustrating factor. This leads to directly to targeting strategies where we can target people that are following certain news publications online, that are using certain hashtags, that are um, engaging with certain content. We can target them directly using Facebook ads or Twitter targeting and get our message in front of them. Um, the simple line, you save lives, great. That really helps us understand that all we have to say is help us save lives. So, Crudy, uh, so uh, you, so, sorry to interject. So, so um, would you recommend that everyone listening essentially kind of I try and identify which of these personas or what the makeup of their potential audience is from these types of personas so that they can then yeah. sort of better target their message as you're suggesting? Absolutely, and uh, persona development is kind of, it's the groundwork from which you would build any kind of strategy. Uh, we do it for every client walking in the door. It doesn't matter if you're a blood bank or if you're the Red Cross. We want to understand the different motivations people have, and essentially what you're doing is when you're sitting there and trying to draft your email newsletter, I bet you're like, well, I could write about this, or I write about that, or I write about this, and that'd be there are five different things that I want to get across, but that's, that's not what you want to do. What you want to say is I have five different people I'm talking to, so each one of them gets one story. And when you segment your communications that way, you're going to get much stronger engagement and therefore much stronger donations, much stronger kind of amplification online. Right. So and I can imagine for some a lot of people listening, you know, again, who may be in a small organization, you know, it feels a little, a little bit overwhelming, right? Like having to do all of this. Like, so it, do you feel that this is sort of like an ongoing process where you're continually looking to better understand your audience and, and you know, the makeup of the personas that you have? So it's not sort of a do this massive project and then let it you know put it to bed it's like a constant um gathering of this sort of who are your personas that are in your particular audience is that your take exactly you making- it, yeah it, well you wouldn't so it doesn't mean that all of a sudden instead of writing one email you have to write five emails every time but it does mean um when a certain type of person donates to you maybe their thank you email looks a little bit different than somebody who checked um a higher age box or it might mean that when you are using Instagram stories or Facebook Live, that this type of story that you're telling is going to be towards a different audience. So impact seekers, for example, we wouldn't use Facebook Live just to kind of, you know, Facebook Live for an impact seeker would be on the boat. Like, here's what we're doing. Here's what is happening. Um, Whereas a humanist, Facebook Live might be something more like, check out this family, here's a picture of a, or a seed of a family reuniting to, um, they found each other, and that's the story, that's the emotional pull right there. So it just helps inform the different types of content that you can send out um, more than it limits. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't seem like an overwhelming amount of work. It should shape the way your funnel is. So right. the third persona right. here, um, just to show you kind of how different these people are, like for this third persona, um, you know, Valentine's Day can be a sticky holiday where I think every nonprofit is like, geez, what are we going to do for Valentine's Day? For us, it was talking specifically to people that were um, emotionally invested in Moaz's mission. So we wanted to talk about love and hope in terms of family. Um, and it did really well. When we rephrased the language this way, we saw a 26% lift in engagement. Um, I saw a question about, well, if they won't, if they won't open my emails, if they won't re- 
see my Facebook posts, if they won't retweet my tweets, what do I do? I think what you do is reshape your communications, and this is how we would do it. Um, if you want to, if you're interested in developing your personas, the first thing I would do is write a survey and try to understand who, what, where, when, why, um, who are they, what resonates with them, where are they, when do they donate, look at um, your donation patterns to find those key seasons and ask open response questions for why. Why do they like you? And that's where the gold is going to be. Yeah, that's great. And I know we had a number of questions from people about survey writing. Um, and again, mm -hmm. you know, we're getting close to the top of the hour. And just as a reminder to everyone, we're going to go a little bit past the hour with our Q&A. So we'll probably stay until about 10 to 15 minutes after the hour. Um, so we'd welcome everyone to continue to stay on with us. Again, we are recording the webinar. So we'll be sending out a link um, to that so you can get anything that you might have missed. Um, but yeah, it, Crudy, if you have any recommendations on survey writing, um, you know, I think a lot of people would love, you know, just some thoughts around that. So I don't know if there's any resources and, and we can again share them with everyone. Um, if you have any samples sure. or anything like that, um, you know, maybe, I don't know if there's anything you can post in the chat for everyone. Um, yeah, you know, I'll dig some things up from the Media Cause blog for sure. That would be terrific. Um, and so now um, I'd like to move on quickly to my colleague Jeremy Koenig is going to talk to us about three ways your nonprofit can connect with millennials. Jeremy. Thanks, Chris, and thanks, speakers. Uh, I'm looking at the chat here. Terry, I totally agree with you that I want Kruti to keep speaking because what she's saying is an absolute goldmine for developing personas for um, donations. So, you know, that actually, as a, as a webinar uh, kind of designer here. I, I think that actually make a great topic for a future uh, full-length webinar, so we'll think about that. Um, I want to jump right into the top three ways your nonprofit can connect with millennial donors right now. Um, at the top of the hour, we talked about, you know, what's the most important thing to you, and, and overwhelmingly it was, how do I get donations for millennials? I'm actually going to sh you, show you three simple steps that you can collect easily collect donations from all types of millennial uh, persona donors. Um, here we go. Make it easy to participate. Um, you see in front of you an example where uh, any individual can either text streets or they can click the IGFN link that, that your organization has posted into uh, social media, promoted with email or text messaging, and then immediately they get led to this mobile-friendly uh, sign up form that has an inspiring video on it and minimal forms. This is an incredible way to get people to uh, participate, connect with your cause in a way that is non monetary. Um, just to reiterate, so the, the, our best practice for engaging uh, the maximum amount of donors is you promote a keyword at a live event or anytime you're with a person in the, in the, in the human form. Uh, to get people to go to their form on their mobile devices, and then you promote the short link for people to be able to click, whether they're on social media, email, um, or on your website to fill out your form. Forms also can be embedded on your website, the same exact form, to be able to get the maximum amount of participants across all the different um, personas. Uh, I just have a quick tip here for, for making it easy to participate. After people register or sign up or volunteer, whatever they're doing, send text messages before, during, and after events, and continuously post videos, photos, uh, and your fundraising totals across social media, and make sure that you thank and tag um, participants. I'm going to move on to the second uh, way that you can get more donations from your donors. Uh, make it uber easy to give. Um, uh, you see here this example, text Darrow to 51555, um, or if you wanted just to type it in, you could type in the IGFN short link that is in the text message here on screen. And again, you get led to a donation form which has minimal fields uh, and actually has small suggested donation amounts. One of the best practices that we continuously see here at Mobile Cause is the or nonprofit organizations that, that engage millennials the best actually ask for small first-time donations. Um, getting, getting millennial donor count is far more important than millennial donor donation totals. Uh, what I mean is if you're sitting around in your board meeting or if you're sitting around with your team, 
don't necessarily think of donor uh, millennials as how much cumulative money they've given, but rather how many donors are engaged in your uh, cause. This is a far more important measure. And again, keep the most important thing is to make it really, really easy by texting a keyword or clicking a link, um, or um, uh, uh, and make sure that that donation form has small suggested donation amounts um, and, and really easy forms. Um, a great, an additional great tip is after somebody has made a first-time donation and they have gotten involved with your cause, then ask them intentionally to step up and make a small recurring gift. This will have hugely uh, lucrative impact on your fundraising. The third step, make it extremely easy for people to fundraise. Again, Anyone in your organization, anyone connected to your organization, uh, should be able to text a word or click a link, and then immediately from any device, they should be able to uh, sign up for you to become a crowdfunder. Um, here you see an example from the United Way, where a, an individual literally in seconds can just put in their name, their mobile number, and their email, and then immediately they receive a link um, via email and via text to uh, upload their photo put in their personal message in their goal, and they're live. And as um, a pr our previous speaker stated, they actually have their own keyword and their own short link that they can share with friends and family uh, to easily collect donations. Uh, I will reiterate this as well, um, this tip that it is actually it's really important to provide all of your crowdfunders um, just kind of canned short videos and photos that they can use to promote their fundraising pages. This will have a huge effect. This is the best time you could ever spend in terms of your staff. And then secondly, give out stickers and t-shirts like crazy to uh, your fundraisers. Millennials specifically dig free swag and they will proudly represent your cause and build awareness um, in all of their circles. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over for Chris. We're going to take about 12 minutes of questions. Um, go ahead, Chris. Take it away. Thanks, Jeremy. Really appreciate it. And again, everyone, thanks for all of your great questions and staying with us. We've got so much great content. I think we could probably go on for another 45 minutes or so. Um, before we dive into the questions, I do want to share with you one other quick poll um, again, sort of about um, our future webinars and some other uh, topics, which will help us deliver great content to you to help all of you. Um, so I, I just shared the poll with all of you. If you wouldn't mind taking a moment, um, taking a look at the questions and submitting some responses for us would be super, super helpful. Um, while you're doing that, again, I would encourage all of you to visit mobilecause.com slash resources. You can also visit mobilecause.com slash demo. There is a link in there um, that Lindsay posted um, under mobile cause marketing um, for a full demo. You can click on that link. Um, again, the team is like super fantastic in terms of our ability to help you and get you know very specific on exactly the questions that you might have and show you exactly how to accomplish the things that you might be looking to accomplish and some of the things that have been recommended in this uh, webinar. So any of those technical questions, um, even regarding credit card processing and fees and all of that stuff, we have a great team that's ready and standing by to help you. Um, so I think uh, we just quickly closed the poll. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back over to questions very quickly to everyone. Um, so sort of the first question, um, I'm going to turn it back to Adam. Um, since he's been patiently waiting with us, you know, what in all of this is your recommendation in terms of what you've seen is the most important of all of this, that what's the most important thing that people should know about millennials? Hmm. Great question. Real millennials. Great. What's the most important thing? Wow. Um, I'm going to tie it down to just three really simple words. Uh, and I think the most important world, word that comes to mind right now is it's got to be real. Um, you got to keep it real in your communication with millennials. You got to be real and transparent with, you know, your mission, where you're at, where you're going, and how they can help get you to where you're going and why really connecting the why with uh, the storytelling. That's 
you don't even have to convince them why they should support you tell a story of a real person going through a real challenge and how you supported them and how that changed their life forever there you don't need to give them the reason about why they should support that's enough to invoke the emotion people don't make logical decisions people make emotional decisions and they just rationalize it with logic so just a, another little key point there i think you should know but keeping it real is as a, as cheesy in 90s as that sounds um you got to keep it real yeah that's a great point and so i think just to add to that would you say then that it's almost more important to be just authentic than it is to be you know polished and have some perfect yes. video or You're, something like that, right? absolutely and that's the gift i mean all the platforms i talked about facebook live snapchat even periscope um they don't really give you the opportunity unless you really take the time to like set up a really professional stage for you you don't really get snapchat is not about professional and polished ever it's uh it is so impromptu but it's so engaging and it's because it's real and people get to see behind the scenes so what you don't put up in your polished youtube videos what you don't put up in your polished articles People see through these platforms, but these platforms are already showing to be more engaging than what was polished before. So, so yeah, that's, that's what I got to say about that. Great, great, great stuff. And now, Kristen, here's a question for you in terms of, you know, time and your ability to do all of this. I mean, again, for everyone listening, like, is this doable? You know, how, how much time did it take you to roll out these campaigns using mobile calls? Um, to be honest, it took me a month. <laughs> Um, we thought of the idea of the angel run um, probably within a month's time, and we actually were going to launch it in August, but we decided, or I decided to move it up to July, so it gave us about 30 days to plan for it, um, but I would not uh, suggest that for other people, um, giving some time to market your campaign to really uh, give people, or in this particular situation, crowd funders. Um, the idea of what it is and how to do it. Um, we have a full list of things on what we want to do to improve for next year um, because there are people that aren't familiar with crowdfunding and how to um, work text to donate and things like that. So we're going to be working on creating videos for next year. So it's crystal clear on how to be a crowdfunder, how to be a runner with our angel run, and ultimately how to fundraise. Fantastic. And so just in, in terms of it sounds like that the bulk of the time that you would prefer to have had is just to have a little bit more time to, to do more marketing before you launched it and, and that type of thing, rather than like the actual setup of the infrastructure. Uh, was that fairly easy to do? Is that something that's doable for oh, everyone? That was cake. Yeah, it was it was cake. It, thanks to um, Lindsay, she had answers every step of the way. So it was super easy to do. Um, any questions that I had, which were, I mean, far and few. So it's pretty straightforward in setting up crowdfunding. I, I mean, I watched a couple of videos here and there, but it's literally straight to the point. So um, it, I definitely would recommend using Lindsay or any other marketing gurus with mobile cause to answer any questions, but it, it was pretty easy. Wonderful. And now here's a question for Crudy. Crudy, here's, a, you know, and I think probably a lot of people who are listening have had this experience, you know, so if you're a millennial and you, who works for baby boomers in a nonprofit, right? So many of us, you know, may have a board that is made up of non-millennials. Yeah. How do you convince your board or the executive, may, you know, organization to sort of get behind, you know, social media and doing more that's more, you know, millennial friendly? Any suggestions there? Yeah, definitely. I spent kind of um, my first half of my career with a bunch of um, Harvard and Wharton MBAs and, um, you know, significantly older and very old school, very kind of business management centric. So the two ways I always push this through is, one, it is the most cost efficient way to reach anyone. You can get it down to the cent, um, eight cents for a click. Um, 12 cents, 38 cents, a dollar 17 for a new donor. You can measure it back so to the cent where you can really make the rationale for it cost me nothing to at least, you know, spend a couple of minutes a day updating this. 
when I want to do a big push, it's going to cost me pennies on the dollar to really reach the right person. And I will know when it's not working and it, it costs you nothing to turn it off. So one is just the cost efficiency for social media is enormous. The second is this is where your audience is. When I saw a couple of questions for like what does it even mean to be good at mobile? To be good at mobile means to be good on the platforms that people are using on their phones. So if they're on Facebook on their phone or if they're on Instagram on their phone or if they are using your website on your on their phone, you really have to invest in where they are. If you go into your Google Analytics for your website and you just break it down by device, if you break it down by referral source, you're going to see either a lot of that is mobile traffic or you're going to see that your bounce rates are really high for mobile device. If your traffic is really high, then obviously you have to keep investing in mobile. If your bounce rates are really high, then obviously you're losing a lot of people because you're not as good as you should be on mobile. So I always make the case in terms of cost efficiency and just kind of the size of my universe is so much bigger when you do invest in these platforms. Those are great answers, and I would encourage everyone to uh, listen to the recording for to, to recap those answers from Crudy, um, because I think you know th that's the the really key ways to to really get that insight. Again, Google Analytics and really understanding where people are coming from. Um, I think those mm -hmm. are fantastic insights, and the cost efficiency. So that's really the best answer to that question is really to to underscore how efficient it is from a cost perspective. Um, when trying to make the case, right? Um, exactly. I mean, you can always do a foot in the door approach, like, okay, give me fifteen hundred dollars to run a social campaign, and then you'll be able to make that case um, with the numbers from one test campaign to invest more in it later too. Right. Right. Fantastic. And now, again, uh, I know we we've gone over, but I, I we do have a couple more questions. I want to get some to Jeremy. So, Jeremy, two questions for you. Um, just have come in just and I want to make sure we get to those answers like in terms of you know QR codes and some other stuff you know what's your take on that I think you know we we would obviously we're talking about text to give what's your take on sort of you know integrating you know what types of codes into your marketing yeah it's a great question uh, the most important rule of thumb is that you promote your uh, your online form whether that be don donation volunteer survey crowdfunding etc um, across all your channels with the proper in the proper format. So, for example, if you're at a live event, use a keyword. Tell people to text uh, your keyword to your short code, and then immediately they'll receive a reply back to click the link from their mobile phone. If you're online on social media, you want to tell people, here's my incredible story, watch my video, look at my picture, and then click here to donate, volunteer, crowdfund. Um, in terms of direct mail, in terms of traditional fundraising, uh, you absolutely can use a QR code to link to that same exact donation form. Um, and so mobile cause technologies specifically are designed to be able to not only engage a new generation of donors, but actually make it really, really easy for people who are um, of the more traditional fundraising demographic to give as easy as possible um, on their mobile devices. Wonderful. And now, you know, the other question is just a simple integration. You know, can you just address briefly the, you know, um, mobile causes integrations to other platforms, uh, you know, such as, uh, you know, in all of those areas because that people would typically want to integrate? Yeah, most definitely. So the mobile cost system is actually really easy to use in terms of collecting um, not only donation information, but donor data. Uh, all our forms can be customized uh, to collect whatever fields you want to collect. And there's, there's really two ways to get that donor data into your CRM. Uh, the first and most traditionally used ways is just through a simple uh, import-export of a CSV file. So, for example, you literally just select the fields that you want to, um, that you want to export. You put those in a field, you hit the export button, you get a CSV file, and then that CSV file is universally digestible by any CRM. Uh, MobileCause also has a, an open API uh, as well as a Salesforce connection. And so we have, uh, as well as some other um, 
uh, direct connections. And so we'll actually work specifically with your nonprofit to get you the solution you need so that all your donor data uh, is collected um, and streamlined as much as possible. Um, I'll just kind of take the final word here. Um, please, please, please reach out to us directly. We have a team of customer success experts that are here to help you uh, dream big, um, to put together specific uh, examples, give you specific um, uh, proposals that you can then take to your uh, leadership team um, to get mobile cause uh, approved so that you can, can, can sign up and to start using all these incredible technologies uh, that we've been talking about on this webinar. Um, Chris? Go ahead and finish us up. Thank you so much, Jeremy. And yes, just a final word. Uh, if there's anything that we've talked about today that you you know still have answers, I'd recommend strongly that you contact us at 888-661-8804 or go to mobilecause.com slash demo. Again, as I mentioned, the team is fantastic at helping people get the answers that they need and speak in you know, plain uh, English in terms of technology and how it will work specifically for what you are working to do. So I'd encourage all of you to do so. And we're here to help provide um, resources to the community overall so we can all uh, you know, continue to make more and more causes more effective globally, right? That's why we're all here. So thanks to all of you um, for attending today. And thanks to our terrific speakers. Um, we're grateful to have all of you, um, you know, donate your time. Um, and again, everyone, thanks to uh, attending today. Please feel free to check back for future we uh, webinars. We look forward to having you again. And again, finally, I'd recommend that you go to mobilecause.com slash resources where you can get um, other recordings for previous webinars with additional insight that may help you. So thanks again to everyone. Have a great day.